our speaker today is uh, Josh DeMoss, who is a, uh, a, actually a, a J.D. Reese um, a dual grad, or, or student rather. Um, he is a uh, graduate of Baylor, where he got a BA in Russian and Political Science, uh, and spent some quite a, a bit of time actually uh, you know, in Russia, uh, working in a number of different uh, internships, uh, and uh, um, such as a Center for Strategic Research, and was also able to attend uh, Russian Presidential Academy's summer campus uh, in Kazan. Uh, he is going to tell us about his experience today working with uh, the Foreign Military Studies Office, the Foreign Civil Fellowship, uh, one of the last uh, to be able to come through this program. Uh, but this in, involves uh, using open uh, source materials, working in language in order to um, you know, look at a number of different projects that are interesting, not only to his own research, but to the uh, folks at the Foreign Military Studies Office. Uh, Ray Finch, uh, uh, representative for working with the students, is, is here as well. Thank you, Bart. Good afternoon, everyone. Like you said, my name is Josh. I'm a JD and MA in Reese because I like to torture myself at school. <laughs> and uh, today, in fulfilling my requirement for the FIMSO graduate research citizenship and in congruence with the course I'm taking in public international law, I'm going to be speaking on uh, Russia and Iran and some of the recent uh, developments in their relationship and uh, the legality of those relationships. Quick overview, we're going to uh, first talk about how Russia views international law and how it applies to their own system, and uh, Russia and the UN, some of the purposes uh, of the Charter, and uh, some of the literature within the Charter. Then we're going to move on to the uh, recent developments uh, that we talked about some of the, uh, over the, since November, some of the things that Russia and Iran have been doing. And then we're going to move on to see uh, whether Russia is fulfilling its legal obligation uh, either supplementing sanctions or enforcing sanctions through customary international law or through written law or treaty law. And then finally we're going to finish up with the future of sanctions and uh, also the future of uh, the UN's legitimacy. So Russian international law, how does Russia view international law? After the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia decided to be bound by the same treaties that the Soviet Union was bound by. Uh, they followed this in accordance with Article 16 of the Vienna Convention on the Succession of States and Respective Treaties. And uh, this is very important because this is how Russia kept its spot on the Security Council. International law is so important uh, to Russia that in the 1993 Constitution, uh, Article 15.4 states that uh, the generally recognized principle and norms of international law and the international treaties of, of the Russian Federation shall constitute an integral part of its legal system. Which is interesting because uh, if you know anything about the American Constitution, which you read, you don't see international law mentioned in our Constitution. But it's an integral part of the Russian system. Uh, such treaties even hold precedence over domestic law in Russia. Uh, the article continues by saying, if an international treaty of the Russian Federation establishes other rules or laws than those stipulated in international law, uh, the rules of the international treaty shall apply. Um, so international, international laws have a, a large effect and precedence in Russia. What's the actual status, besides just the written word? Um, the, actual, the actual status of international law in Russia, just like any other international law in the world, is determined by a few factors, including the nature and applicability of the law, uh, whether it's a democratic institution, with the government, uh, the rule of law, politics, and uh, participation in international institutions is a, is a, is a big one. And uh, arguably the most important participation in international institution for Russia is its status and placement on the Security Council. Uh, chapter 5 of the UN Charter lays out the functions and powers of the Security Council. Uh, the foremost being to maintain peace and security uh, in accordance with the principles and purposes of the United Nation, Nations. Uh, a few of the functions listed to maintain international peace and security include uh, to, recommend to recommend methods of adjusting disputes or terms of settlement to formulate plans for the establishment of a system to regulate armaments, and to call to members to apply sanctions and other measures not involving a force to prevent or stop aggression. Uh, Security Council resolutions have primacy even over uh, treaties between nations, uh, and according to Article 103. And Article, Article 103 states, 
In the event of a conflict between the obligations of the members of the United Nations under the present charter and their obligations under any other international agreement, the obligations under the ch charter shall prevail. Of course, uh, the language means that uh, the resolution must abide by the charter first if it's not meeting the intention of the UN. Let's say, um, hypothetically, if uh, the Security Council passed a resolution that was going to be harmful to human rights, obviously that uh, resolution would be illegal from the beginning. Um, an essential use for the article, though, for our purpose, for decades, has been uh, excusing members for their non-compliance with trade and economic agreements between nations. Uh, so, uh, if Russia and China have an international agreement uh, to trade oil, and uh, then the UN places sanctions on China, then uh, Russia and China can then uh, they have a legal obligation then to break their contract, their treaty. Of course, uh, sanctions have been an important mechanism for uh, maintaining peace and security for the UN, and it is the main way of maintaining it. Um, I even have a further, um, the UN has even uh, submitted uh, books, I have, let's see if I can find the uh, reports on, uh, to further implement uh, UN, um, UN treaties and sanctions. Uh, I actually found this one in the library. It's uh, Best Practices and Recommendations for Improving the Effectiveness of United Nations Sanctions. Um, it's a report by the Security Council in 2006. Uh, the Council made the report with a few spe uh, specifications um, for targeted specifications, it says, to be effective. Appropriate action must be taken by the members, um, and this appropriate action is proper design, uh, evaluation, and supplementing of sanctions, rather than just the sanctions the UN itself enforces. Uh, for implementation, the report encourages member states to create a national mechanism, uh, not only just the international mechanism, to improve the implementation of sanctions. In the same year, in 2006, the UN first sanctioned Iran after the International Atomic Energy Agency rega regarding Iran's non-compliance with its safeguard agreement on nuclear activities and re re Iran's rejection to Security Council's demand to spend all enrichment-related activities and reprocessing activities. The Security Council uh, passed many resolutions imposing these sanctions on Iran. Uh, to further enforce these sanctions, many nations in the West and in the East, um, including the European Union, imposed additional sanctions on Iran, uh, Iran's trade, uh, financial services, energy sectors, and technologies. Um, next we go to uh, Russia and Iran's uh, recent relations. Um, if you remember the news in November, uh, November, the uh, uh, permanent members of the Security Council and uh, plus Germany met with leaders of, of Iran in Geneva um, and uh, reached an agreement. The EU has not released the text of that agreement yet, but we get the gist of uh, what the agreement entails. Um, it says that Iran will not develop any uranium enrichment or nuclear, or nuclear facilities, and in return, Iran will receive relief from sanctions and no additional ones will be imposed. Uh, just three weeks later, uh, on December 11th, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met with Iranian leaders in Tehran to discuss various top topics, particularly the fate of the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, these Tehran negotiations re resulted in a finalization of an oil trade uh, agreement that consists of Russia acquiring 500,000 barrels of oil a day in exchange for Russian goods to Iran, making Russia the largest importer of, of Iranian oil and worth $1.5 billion a month. Well, many people would ask, well, why does Russia need Iranian oil? Russia is already the largest producer of, oil, producer of oil in the world. One key aspect of oil and gas is that um, it's hard to prove of its origin. Russia will likely sell the imported Iranian oil as its own. It will be Russian oil to them. Moreover, Iranian loyal uh, law forbids foreign investors from having mining rights for oil and gas in Iran, but Russian companies are seeking that right, and the Iranian government is letting them seek that right uh, to mine uh, oil and gas. Uh, Spearbank, uh, a Russian uh, bank, has, set, has suggested that um, they need the oil because uh, Russia has more of a need for energy domestically, and Russia could then sell this Iranian oil to the Asian Pacific market, while keeping some of its own, strengthening itself in the regional and the global energy market. However, uh, Russia, attempted, Russia and Iran have attempted such deals in the past, but they have failed, uh, such as 2011, Russian and uh, Gazprom and Iran uh, tried to make a deal. Uh, the following month, 
uh, the, the West was very upset and said that Russia was violating uh, UN sanctions and not supplementing their own. And uh, there was a lot of criticism towards Russia. However, uh, Russia's representative to the EU, uh, Vladimir Shizov, uh, in anticipation of the EU summit that month, month with Russia, stated that Russia is not violating any sanctions against Iran because it only follows UN sanctions and its interpretation of those, not Western trade sanctions against Iran. Russia finds all other sanctions not, not uh, a part of the UN as illegitimate. Russia believes this and, take, and took this opportunity because they believe that if they wait until relations uh, sanctions are lifted, which it seems like uh, the trend is going to where sanctions are being lifted and lightened, Western countries will then infiltrate the Iranian market. Uh, Moscow is currently in a good position to establish economic ties with Iran, <coughs> which would be more difficult for the West uh, if Moscow uh, established relations first. Uh, chairman of, for the Center of, uh, for Modern Iran in Russia says that uh, Iran needs the money and goods because the last 18 months uh, sanctions have really limited the export exportability of oil and Russia gains a political and economic advantages as one of the strongest countries in the nation, in the region. In March, as a result of these negotiations on the oil trade deal, uh, Russia and Iran have, are finalizing a nuclear deal. Um, from these talks, Russia will help Iran build two new nuclear plants in southern Iran. Again, Russia claims that it is not violating any uh, resolution or national law, but rather this is, a peaceful, this is only peaceful nuclear energy, not the case or reason for the restrictions or sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council. <coughs> not only does Russia and Iran have, have a direct relationship with each other, um, Russia has also been a third party uh, to maneuvering around these sanctions. Um, Russian banks have been an uh, intermediary uh, with China banks um, after China shifted trades with Iran into its national currency. This has allowed Iranian oil to flow to Beijing sanctionless because uh, the Chinese currency is not freely convertible like the dollar or the euro. Uh, and this has created a barter system like Russia has with Iran right now um, to allow um, Iran to spend the currency on goods and services from Chinese company, for, for Chinese companies. Um, to help with this system, the Russian makes have stepped in as the middleman um, and handled the courtesy and sent to Iran and obviously taken a big chunk for themselves. Um, the entire process of these sanctions and maintenance um, of peace and security is a legal process. And it can and shall be maintained only as far as the legal norms provide and uh, their certainty. Which then presents us with uh, this legal question. Um, whether Russia is under a legal obligation to implement, accept, and enforce sanctions on Iran, uh, both the UN sanctions in their interpretation and uh, supplemental sanctions. Uh, first, we're uh, going to um, uh, look at customary international law and whether there is um, customary international law for Russia to enforce supplemental sanctions on Iran. Uh, we looked at the, IS, uh, the ICJ statute to um, understand our source of, inter of customary international law. Uh, and it says uh, a general practice that is accepted by law, and we separate those into two. Um, in a series of cases known as the North Sea Continental Shelf Cases, the ICJ confirmed that state practice, an objective element, and opinio juris, the subjective element, are essential prerequisites for the for formation of a customary law rule. Uh, and uh, as also in that case, it laid out three different types of criteria for the state practice. The first being generality. Uh, generality encompasses that most states, or at least the vast majority, accept and apply a rule or law. Since Iran's uh, non-compliance with the Safeguard Agreement in 2006, there have been eight Security Council resolutions involving sanctions on Iran. Um, since then, China has uh, slowed its trade on investment uh, position with Iran to supplement the sanctions before it uh, started going around through the Russian banks. Um, Australia has imposed further, further financial sanctions and uh, travel bans <coughs> on individuals and entities involved in Iran's nuclear program. And India has banned export on anything that could contribute to the program. And obviously the EU and the United States have imposed an arms ban and almost a total economic embargo on Iran. The second factor uh, looks at the consistency, consistency and the uniformity of the behavior in the sanctions. And it's seen that uh, there seems to be a clear uniformity with the sanctions that they're imposing sanctions uh, on financial institutions, entities, and individuals with it, uh, that have relations with Iran's nuclear program. And duration uh, is the third factor. And since the first resolution was passed and imposed sanctions, it's been 12 years. 
and whether that's considered a, a long enough time to establish customary law is up for argument. Of course, there have been objections to uh, supplementing these uh, sanctions uh, because China and Russia have caused many Security Council resolutions uh, that were imposing sanctions on Iran uh, to be amended after vetoing them. And just recently, as 2013, India has said that it will not expand any more sanctions against Iran and is against any UN sanctions against Iran. Moreover, even Western courts have said that these sanctions are illegitimate sometimes. Uh, the EU court uh, has ruled twice that sanctions imposed against Iran have been illegal. Uh, not only must this law in question be a settled, uh, settled state practice, but it should be carried out in a way to show evidence of a belief that this practice is rendered obligatory. This is known as opinio juris, uh, state practice and of, is often seen as a reflection of opinio juris. Um, opinio juris is explained by the ICJ as, for a new customary rule to be formed, not only must the acts concerned amount to a settled practice, but they may be accompanied by uh, opinio juris. Either the states uh, taking such action or other states in positions to react to it must have behaved so that their conduct is evidence of a belief that the practice is rendered obligatory by the existence of a rule requiring it. The need for such belief, the subjective element, is implicit in the very notion of opinio juris. This, rele this relevant practice uh, must be consistent and uniform to show the legal, legal obligation. And as the aforementioned arguments we talked about uh, show, um, the fluctuations do not show um, consistency and uniform usage. Of course, there are some exceptions to uh, any customary law rule, um, one being that when a state acts in a particular way only because of political reasons or convenience, and not a belief that the practice is binding on the state by a legal obligation, there is no formation of customary international law. <coughs> Secondly, when a state has expressly refused to be bound by the customary law since its inception and continues to be um, express its refusal to accept this law, it is considered a persistent objector and is exempt from the rule as well. Uh, since the Security Council first introduced sanctions against Iran, Russia has rejected the sanctions and has argued against them every single time. It has taken uh, amendments, uh, many amendments for each resolution to be approved by Russia and China. And even in 2006, when the first ones were, were approved, George Bush had to call uh, uh, Putin to uh, get him to finally approve the resolution. Uh, regardless, although Russia has continuously uh, disapproved the sanctions against Iran um, and has not applied its own national sanctions against Iran, um, it did approve the resolutions. Is it, uh, does this make Russia actually a persistent objector? The answer is unclear. Next we look to uh, the written law or the treaty law. Um, as you can see, customary international law is uh, hard to pin down, hard to form, and uh, hard to point out. Um, and as a result, states have historically resulted to writing, specifically treaties, resolutions, um, because these are convenient devices for guaranteeing that states' interests are met. Um, the, law, the law of treaties also covers resolutions uh, because it's a formal agreement. Uh, the relationship between the UN Charter and the Security Council resolutions um, is, is very significant. First we look again to Article 103 that we spoke of earlier and how um, any Security Council resolution holds primacy between uh, trade and economic agreements between nations. Secondly, Article 49, uh, as well as these reports that I've, I've shown, uh, call for all members to take measures to aid um, the Security Council decision. Uh, which may include supplementing the sanctions with their own national mechanism. Uh, the interpretation of the Security Council resolutions should be interpreted to have an impact on international law if they are if they are legal from the beginning and are in accordance with the UN Charter. Uh, more, moreover, in accordance with the Vienna Convention on Treaties, um, a treaty should be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in the light of the object and purpose of that treaty. The Security Council imposed uh, Resolution 1737 in 2006 after Iran failed to abide by the injunction of to the, uh, earlier that year. Um, as stated earlier, Russia voted on the re uh, resolution, and although not all the resolutions are explicit, the uh, company, the entities that are involved with entities, and individuals involved with Iran's nuclear program are listed and give out um, straightforward uh, sanctions on those people. It imposes a freeze on the assets of those people, and it even established a committee to oversee the uh, implementation of the sanctions. Uh, the main organization in the resolution that was sanctioned was the Atomic Energy of Iran. Um, in March of 2014, as we spoke of earlier, with Russia 
uh, agreeing to build two new nuclear plants, they met with this company, uh, with Russia's, um, Ross Atom is the name of the company, and uh, held a series of talks with this organization. Is this applying the resolution in a good faith, or um, is it just Russia interpreting it? Um, is it the interpretation differently for Russia compared to the West? <coughs> uh, finally, we look to the future um, of, these, of the implementation of sanctions and supplements of these sanctions. And we look to see whether these sanctions have actually been effective. As you can see in the cartoon, um, it looks like a dog with no teeth has had a hard time uh, implementing the sanctions. Um, Reading the Iranian uh, news and the Russian news, uh, you can see that they believe sanctions have not been effective and not been harmful. I read an article last week that the Iranian foreign minister sent a message to Russia saying that the uh, Iranian solution to the situation in Ukraine will not be uh, effective because sanctions have not hurt Iran enough and they will not affect Russia enough. But if you look at uh, the actual, uh, when the economists look at the, the situation, um, Iran's uh, export of oil and uh, goods is about $5 billion, and without sanctions it would be around $20 billion, um, or even a quadruple that amount, uh, economists say. And so it's, um, it seems uh, unfair to say that uh, Iran's sanctions have uh, not been effective, uh, at least to an extent. Um, but next we uh, look to then to the legitimacy of the UN and those uh, sanctions and the resolutions. As you can see, there has been legal uncertainty on whether there are actually um, supplement, whether there should actually be supplements to these sanctions from nations, and uh, the different interpretations of uh, these sanctions on nations. Uh, when there isn't legal certainty, um, there seems to be a lack of stability, and without stability, it seems that there can't be legitimacy. Uh, legal certainty should be an inevitable requirement for the UN to effectively maintain peace and security. Compliance, and I think most importantly, consistency uh, with the legal framework of the Security Council and applying of resolutions should be the most important uh, when applying any treaty uh, or supplement to those sanctions. Um, sanctions and the UN may have a problem in the long run if they don't find a consistent uh, uh, legal framework. Um, eventually, many uh, member states will realize the Council is applying a lot different law than it did um, from what it was originally set out to do. Um, this will make the adoption of further de decisions more difficult uh, for the, the Security Council and will increasingly paralyze the Council's uh, resolutions. Even in cases where decisions are adopted, it seems that non compliance, <coughs> protests, and even disobedience would be uh, practiced at the member state and or at, the re at the regional group level. Is there a solution? <coughs> well, it seems hard to, ha hard to say because state sovereignty is still really important in our world society. Uh, though I do have two suggestions. Like I said, I think there needs to be consistency in the legal framework and applying of the sanctions. Um, the different interpretations by different nations has made it hard to apply, um, made it hard to apply these sanctions and these supplements. Uh, the interpretation and enforcement must be consistent and transparent. And lastly, uh, the decisions should be then respected uh, by, the, by the member states. Uh, to give a summary, we talked about how uh, Russians view international law and how it applies to their system and some important aspects of the Charter um, International Law. We then talked about the recent developments in Russian-Iranian relations, um, and then we went on to uh, the legal arguments uh, of customary international law and treaty law. And then finally we ended up with the future of sanctions and the future of human legitimacy. Do we have any comments or questions? <laughs>